Hi, you are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hello, I am so excited to be back in the ladies' room today with a very special guest who is somebody who I really looked up to when I was a teenager and a college student, even though we're the same age. I've since had the pleasure of meeting Nancy Hogshead and getting to know her and her work through the magic of Facebook. And small board, fun fact, we even discovered that as teenagers, we had a crush on the same guy. <laughs> The summary version of her very extensive and impressive bio is that Nancy Hogshead Makar is a three-time Olympic champion swimmer, a leading civil rights lawyer, and founder of the organization Champion Women. And we're going to talk about all of those things. But we're also going to talk about many of the backstory challenges she faced along the way that you might not be familiar with and how those experiences have motivated her to help others. In particular, uh, we have a timely and deeply personal topic to discuss today, not only for each one of us as individuals, but unfortunately for millions of other women. We're going to talk about the explosive Me Too movement, our personal connections to it, and many of the medical and legal consequences of everything that's been lumped into the broad category of sexual misconduct, from sexual harassment, sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, sexual assault, and rape. But before we go there, and we are going to go there, I have to tell you a little bit more about Nancy's extraordinary background, as if having been a three-time Olympic champion isn't extraordinary enough. So Nancy was an outstanding competitive swimmer as a high school student, and we have that in common, except she was way more outstanding than I ever was. And she was the recipient of Duke University's first swimming scholarship. She also qualified for the 1980 United States Olympic team, only to miss competing because of the United States Olympic boycott that year. While she swam at Duke only for a year, she was a four-time ACC champion and a two-time All-American during that time. Unfortunately, she got redshirted by Duke after the fall of 1981. Now, we're familiar with the term redshirting for injured athletes who've been sidelined from all sorts of injuries. But Nancy's was different. She was redshirted after being brutally raped by a stranger while running on campus, and she suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder for several months afterwards. Eventually, her coach offered to renew her scholarship if she would only just show up for competitions. She has said that re-entering competitive swimming awakened her competitive juices, so much so, in fact, that she left Duke in the spring of 1983 to train full-time for the 1984 Olympics. The rest is Olympic history. She won three golds and a silver medal, won such media acclaim that she was on the cover of Newsweek magazine, and she won the hearts of Americans with her beaming smile, her charm, and her positive attitude. But here's the rest of the story that most people, including me, and I was a big fan, didn't know. During one race where she missed winning a bronze medal by seven one hundredths of a second, she suffered a bronchial spasm that led to being diagnosed with asthma. After getting over her initial shock and disbelief, she accepted the condition, learned to monitor and control it, and eventually became the national spokesperson for the American Lung Association. She also wrote the 1990 book, Asthma and Exercise, which was the first comprehensive book on asthma and sports, discussing inspirational stories of athletes with asthma who learned to manage and control and overcome their condition. Another story I have to share with you about Nancy Hogshead McCarr and before we let her talk is aimed at all of those parents and students who don't yet recognize the powerful potential impact of internships. Now, when Nancy was a college student, she interned at the Women's Sports Foundation. The organization had such a strong influence on her career direction that she continued working with the group for over 30 years. She served on its board of uh, trustees for several years and as its president from 1993 to 1994. She's currently the senior director of advocacy for them. As an athlete, Nancy Hogs had re realized that a person must understand the law in order to be an effective advocate for equity in college sports using Title IX. So she went to Georgetown University Law Center, joined the private practice at Holland and Knight in Jacksonville, Florida, where she represents student athletes and universities in matters related to Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. And we are gonna talk about that because 
sadly, I don't think many women remember that or realize what an effect it's had on women in sports and, and higher education in general. Her goal is to achieve legal compliance without litigation. Nancy has also been a tenured professor at Florida Coastal Law School in Jacksonville, where she taught torts and sports law courses, uh, including gender equity and athletics. She's also served on a number of national and statewide committees and organizations championing women's rights, issues related to collegiate sports. She served on the editorial board of the Journal of Intercollegiate Sport. She's been an anti-doping evaluator, been a board member on the Aspen Institute, and served on the Florida Governor's Council on Physical Fitness, which developed a statewide plan of action to promote physical fitness and nutrition, particularly among children. She's also a founding member of FCSL Sports Law Center, which offers students a certificate in sports law. And she's uh, testified before Congress numerous times and served on two presidential com committees on gender and sports. She co-edited the, co the book Equal, Pay, Equal Play, Title IX and Social Change with economist Andrew Zimbalist, and has also written numerous scholarly and lay articles. She's widely quoted and interviewed on topics related to gender equity, including participation, treatment, scholarships, sexual harassment and assault and pregnancy discrimination. She has received so many awards for her accomplishments in sports advocacy and leadership that I would use up all her time if I listed them. But most importantly, she is here live in the ladies room with Dr. Donica, and I can't wait any more for this conversation to begin. Nancy, <laughs> welcome. Thank well, you. that was quite an introduction. Thank you very much. I think before before we when we were planning this, I said, "Oh, just make sure they know that I was an Olympian, that I'm a lawyer, and that I run Champion Women." But that was that was pretty thorough. Thank you very well, I'm, much. I'm very detail oriented at times, and today we're going to get detail oriented. And okay. I just want to just jump right into this conversation because sure. I know people are very eager to hear what you have to say about your experiences with the Me Too movement, uh, certainly in sports, but also in your own uh, personal life. Mm -hmm. I think that before we get into all of those issues, I wanna have a vocabulary lesson mm. uh, so that all of our listeners are on the same page. I know that one of the things I've been very frustrated about watching media coverage and reading media coverage on this issue is people are throwing around all kinds of terms without really using the same definitions. Sure. So first of all, what is sexual misconduct? Okay. Well, let's start with sexual harassment, if okay. we could. Yeah, sure. So sexual okay. harassment is harassing somebody because of their gender. So you're belittling or humiliating or uh, uh, bringing up something about their gender that in, in a derogatory type way. So it can be showing somebody porn or, uh, you know, having them view uncomfortable things on the, right? It can be... Uh, you know, touching or making jokes that where women are always the butt of the joke. It can be, um, uh, but it, right, but it the, sort of at its core, it's uh, using somebody's sex as a way to humiliate and degrade them, kind of like the same way that a racist would use somebody's race to humiliate and degrade them. And usually in these situations uh, that come to attention, they're not one shot situations. They're usually yeah. a pattern and they're usually oh, a yeah, yeah, period yeah. of time. So it, it becomes a cumulative thing. So now let's define what is sexual assault. Sure. Sexual assault is, uh, well, there, <clears throat> uh, sexual assault uh, is any kind of sexual contact that is unwanted. So it can be anything from rubbing somebody's genitals up against each other, grabbing somebody else's genitals, all the way to rape. Right, so it's unwanted sexual contact. So it is, um, um, you know, it's not just like accidentally brushing up against somebody. It's touching somebody in a sexual way. It's sort of a you, you know, a, a come on, if you will, uh, in the workforce. So from a legal perspective, sexual assault includes rape. Correct. But is rape an aggravated sexual assault, or is it a separate category, or is mm -hmm. it? Is any sexual yeah. assault treated well, the same way legally? Sure. No, rape is the penetration orally, anally, or or uh, vaginally. So it's it's penetration, whether it's by any object, any object, right? So it's penetration. Mm -hmm. 
is uh, is rape. So it's a it's it's just it's it's sort of under the umbrella of sexual assault. So I think that's where I, some people get a little fuzzy when people talk about sexual assault being rape, and other people talk about sexually being sexually assaulted because you know they get grabbed by their buttocks by their and by their boss all the time, or grabbed by you know the pussy by their uh, president. Um, yeah. I couldn't resist. Uh, now talk to me about consent. Consent. Uh, uh, what you know? I actually have have kids, uh, and what I say, what you're looking for is, you want enthusiastic consent. Yeah. You want unequivocal. You want uh, direct. You know, yes, I'm just as excited about doing this <laughs> as you are. However, um, there are yeah. circumstances when somebody might be just as excited about doing this as you are, but uh -huh. they're still not legally able to give consent to uh -huh. one of those circumstances. Right, one is if somebody's blotto drunk. Mm -hmm. So a few drinks is not, does not in a, uh, does not mean that somebody cannot consent. Well, that, uh, may be, that may be in general, but what's interesting on college campuses, and I've dealt mm -hmm. with very few cases of this, mm -hmm. and you are definitely the expert, but um, my understanding is that college campuses can make their own definitions if it's in their handbook. And I've seen some sure. college campuses where they actually say, if uh, the woman has had any alcohol, that defines a situation where consent is not uh, able to be given. I, I doubt that. Would I, that be um, held up to a legal standard? Yeah, no, it's not going to hold up. Yeah, <laughs> just, because that would eliminate 90% of sexual contact on college campuses. Well, I mean, that's 90% of sexual contact with me and my husband. <laughs> That's, uh, that's, uh, you know, um, people can still consent just fine. You know, just like people can usually drive if they've had one drink, mm -hmm. that that does not hit some legal threshold. So the same thing with alcohol, it just one or two drinks is not going to hit the legal threshold. You have to be unable to consent the way that, you know, when somebody like when they're staggering or slurring their speech or, um, saying crazy things or throwing up, that's what you're, that, that's, that means that person's unable to consent. So what other circumstances make somebody unable to consent? Certainly age. Age, I was just gonna say, yeah, so children. So um, we were talking a little bit before about um, some brain science and the reason why we don't allow children to consent is because it's not that they don't feel sexual, it's not that they don't have sexual feelings, it is that, um, their brains, particularly the frontal lobes, are just not hardwired enough yet. My husband actually had a case in front of the United States Supreme Court where he- and your husband argued, is a judge and an attorney. Right, he's a judge. Well, he's a judge now, but he was the Solicitor General for the state of Florida. And uh, so his job going to the United States Supreme Court was the issue was, can you sentence somebody who has, uh, um, uh, who is a juvenile and has not killed anybody, can you sentence them to life in prison without the possibility of parole? And Supreme Court came back and said no, in large part because of all the research on brain science and what the difference between a 16, 17 year old's brain and a 19, 20 year old's brain. And the, the, the frontal lobes are just not uh, in, they're just not meshed yet. And um, so it's really easy to manipulate children, when I mean children, uh, you know, a minor, anybody 17 or under, and uh, you know, you can, you can get consent, uh, sort of willing participation from a five-year-old, from a mm -hmm. six-year-old, right? And I think we would all agree that's, you know, crazy cakes. Mm -hmm. but, but, so, but it, it is the same point with a 15, 16, 17-year-old, is that they cannot give consent to, uh, to an adult. Okay. Anybody, other categories of people who can't give consent? What about people with intellectual disabilities? How does Correct. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People with intellectual disabilities. Um, yeah, you'd want to make sure uh, before, con you know, having uh, sex that they had the, the capability of actually knowing what was involved and what was happening, that they weren't just saying yes because they really want to please. Uh, I know particularly Down syndrome kids or uh, adults. You know, they really want to please somebody else. So you got to make sure that they, they understand what it is that you're asking. Yeah, yeah I was sure. just reading that uh, people with intellectual disabilities are twice as likely as the general population to be raped or sexually assaulted. The numbers of women who are raped and sexually assaulted are staggering. Staggering. Um, really staggering. staggering. And I just want to throw out a couple of statistics. Um, since 1998, 
there have been mm -hmm. 17 million 700,000 victims, uh, women victims of rape wow. uh, in the United States. 99% yeah. of the perpetrators have gone free. Um, yeah. I also want to talk about the medical consequences, of course, of, of rape. Sure. Um, one of the things that definitely gets my blood boiling is when I hear people in the media saying things like, oh, that was 30 years ago. Get over it. Yeah. Um, right. I was attacked in 1981, and um, I am not over it. Yeah. Um, I got through it, uh, and I know you have had a much worse experience um, and clearly went on to have a phenomenally successful life. But that doesn't mean that we ever forget about it. No, no, no. It definitely informs your life experience for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, I was sexually assaulted as a sophomore in college. I was out on a run. Um, I was at Duke University, and Duke has two campuses, and I was running in between the two of them, and it was just in the afternoon, and uh, somebody was slowly jogging towards me, and I had every light bulb going off, and I actually started running into the street uh, to kind of get away from him, and, um, uh, and he grabbed me, and we fought, and he pulled me into the there was some brush that was like these giant evergreen trees and we fought inside the evergreen trees and I was only wearing shorts and a t-shirt and he was wearing, you know, pants, but I really got scraped up. We really, I mean, it was a fight to the death. I mean, I really fought with everything I knew how to fight with and I lost. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he, then he pulled me deeper into the woods and, um, and I guess the rape lasted about two and a half hours. Oh my God. And it was as, as brutal and as degrading and as just humiliating as you can imagine. Um, and, and, uh, and he was really kind of a crazy cakes kind of guy. He would shift between like, I'm going to kill you to on the other side, like, isn't this fun? Ew. Well, we, you know, we're, we're having this great time on this date here. Uh, I said something about how this was rape, and he said, um, this isn't rape. This is just you and me having a little fun. Oh, God. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, so uh, after a while, um, in swim practice, uh, about once a year, I used to pass out. So I'm familiar with passing, what passing out feels like. And I, it was cold outside. It was only like 40 degrees, and I wasn't wearing anything. And I started getting that closed-in feeling of passing out, you know, where like, you know, everything started get, gets black around the edges right there. And I realized that I was passing out. And if I passed out, I probably was going to die. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, so um, end? what's that? How did this end? So I started crying. And for my rapist, that seemed to be what he wanted, frankly, is he really wanted me to be humiliated and sort of to lose it. So as soon as I started crying, then I could tell that he kind of liked it. So I started crying harder mm. and he was gone within, I'd say probably, you know, one, two, three minutes after that. And he left at the very end saying, you know, I really respect you. I really, and I said, don't do this to anybody else. And he said, I won't. Mm. I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> he doesn't even think that there was like, that he did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, if you, I mean, I just, um, b before I was raped, I thought that the kind of person who got raped was I mean, not like me. Mm -hmm. I thought this was somebody who, um, you know, maybe wasn't very happy or wasn't goal oriented or wasn't strong. My God, I was strong as an ox. Mm -hmm. I was, I was in the point oh 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 one percent of strong women. Um, and you and, have the hardware to prove it. Yeah, right, right. Uh, started lifting weights when I was 10 years old. Um, he didn't have a weapon. I still couldn't get away. Um, but I, um, it was just hard to, I really had to sort of rewrap. I, I thought that I could sort of achieve my way out of sexism. I thought that if I was smart and that if I was a good athlete, that nothing, that sexism being degraded because you're a female would never happen to me. Mm. And I just could not have been more wrong. And that's sort of this, the, the grand aha I had was that until it gets better for everyone, it's not going to get better for me. Like it, there's, there's no way that any one person, any one female can lead their life in such a way that they never get raped or that they don't get sexually harassed. 
or that they don't get sexually assaulted. I mean, all the terms we just went through. Right. There's just no way you can lead your life so that that doesn't happen to you. And I think the message for all our listeners who it has happened to, and I'm reacting yeah. to this in terms of my own experiences as well, is it's not your fault. It's not, not your fault. Anything. And of right. course, in this story, this was so random. This was a stranger. The majority of women who are raped right. are raped. Majority. Well, they know. Right. Um, I was actually attacked by a guy who was a classmate of mine in college who I knew to say hello to, but I had no, I never, we never had a conversation. I didn't know him well. Uh, he actually broke into my dorm room. And I've never talked about this publicly. You've been much more brave than I have. Well, good for you. Inspiring me, just like you inspire. Yeah, go, um, go, go, go. Um, but he, wait, 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 he, but before you tell your story, sure. I just want everybody out there to know that it's so important for younger women who, when they're going through this, to hear from older women like ourselves, I mean, women who, you know, I'm 55, to let them know that there, there is hope for a productive and wonderful and happy life, which I didn't understand or appreciate or think was really possible when I was 19 years old. I really felt like it was over, but I was never going to get married. I was never going to have a family. I was never going to have a successful career. I was never going to be able to think about anything other than being terrified of having just been raped. Mm -hmm. So with that, this is why it's so important for you, Donica, to share your story as well. Well, and 13% of women who've been raped or victims of attempted rape can have attempt suicide. So um, this is yeah. really you know, and as much as we're hearing all of these stories in the Me Too movement right now, yeah. we're not hearing the stories from women who killed themselves. And when we hear about women in Hollywood, you know, one of the things, I don't know why I thought of this, but I immediately went to thinking about Marilyn Monroe and oh, all of right. her struggles with drug addiction and alcohol abuse. Uh, and yeah. certainly she had uh, a history of child sexual abuse. Right. But I wondered as a young actress, what her Me Too stories would mm. have been. Uh, and I think- Heartbreaking to think about. I think those probably greatly influenced her, uh, as well as you know the scores of other women who, whose names we don't know. Mm. Women not only turn to suicide or suicide attempts, but they come, become depressed, anxious, and of course, uh, substance abusers. Absolutely, uh, right. they're trying to medicate their way out of absolutely. feeling- Out of feeling the pain. Uh, exactly, um, feeling right. The pain. Right. I, you know, I really related to the part of your story where you thought because you were so strong and you know so physically right. capable that that would protect you in any situation. I felt that way. Of course, I was a competitive swimmer also. I didn't start doing weights until I was 12, though. Um, <laughs> but I was also from Brooklyn, New York. I was tough. I was streetwise and savvy and trained. And this happened to me in the sleepy little town of Princeton University, which has ivy growing on the walls and a right. fence around it. Right. Um, Where you feel really safe. We really felt safe. Yeah. Um, and I never expected in a million years to open a locked dorm room because I left it locked and it was locked yeah. when I opened it. Mm. To open the dorm room, it was dark and I was immediately ambushed. Um, and I was totally shocked and taken aback. Um, the thing I shared with you earlier is the funny thing about this story is I was actually on a date with a young man who was the perfect gentleman who only walked me to the door of my dorm room, uh, mm -hmm. of my dorm, not the room. Yay. If he walked me to my dorm room, this would have a very different oh, ending. Yeah, right. Um, but I was ambushed uh, to and did fight uh, with everything I had. And I had a big advantage over you in that situation. And that was, I was not wearing running clothes. I was wearing Calvin Klein, really tight jeans. Mm. And as Brooke Shields said in the commercial in those days, nothing comes between me and my Calvins. And he literally couldn't get them off and hold me down at the same time. Wow. And that gave me yeah. a huge competitive advantage in terms of fighting back. And I did not cry, but I bit him. Uh, very, Good. very hard on a very, Love hearing body, that. on a very delicate part of his body. Um, Good for you. he, I remember, I will never forget this. It was his tongue, by the way, in case you're okay. uh, other, other ideas. Um, but I remember he just stood up and put his hand to his face and, and sort of stared at me in shock and said, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> and then he left. Um, right. And, like, I can't believe, and I, it's just uh, the absurdity of the moment. Sometimes in moments right. like this in your life, 
I often feel like if I saw this in a movie, I would be like, seriously, right, right. <laughs> you can't make me believe that, that didn't happen. Um, in my case, though, I did uh, press charges through the university system. Um, okay. And it went well only because I had corroborating evidence. Right. Um, you know, the, you know, this is another thing that's so infuriating about this situation is that the testimony of the victim is not considered evidence. It's considered he said, she said. And he says, oh, it was a consensual encounter. Yeah, mm -hmm. I consented to being beat up and attacked. Like, what? On what planet? Yeah. Um, but I well, was- Well, well just, just you know, from, I want to correct this from any uh, um, person out there, but um, testimony is evidence. And that may have been true back in 1981, but I'm telling you now that both in a criminal court or a civil court or whatever, that, uh, that, somebody's testimony is, is, uh, has been enough to put somebody away for the rest of their lives in not just rape, but in every kind of crime that there is. So yeah, whether I was not talking about a court of law. I was talking about a disciplinary, uh, I know, but, but right. But it should be much, much easier in a disciplinary proceeding absolutely. than it is, than it, sh than it is for, um, for, right. But, but this idea that like, well, we just can't tell between yeah. these two stories. I mean, we, we make judgments all the time about who's more credible, who looks like they're telling the truth, what, you know, and you have like kind of markers around that. Right, although that works against some women when their credibility is then questioned. And I think Absolutely. that's a huge issue in women not coming forward. Absolutely, because right, no. No, I went directly from the woods being raped, I went to the police station. And you were and able to walk and get there? How did you physically get there? Um, so I actually hailed a car that was, he kept saying he was gonna take me away, and he kept saying his car was coming from one direction, so I wanted a car that was coming from the other, after he left and he went in one direction, I wanted a car coming from the other direction. So I kept like running back and forth when cars would come this way, because I didn't want it to be him. Mm -hmm. So I found somebody, and uh, the guy, you can imagine, I mean, I was completely beaten up. I just had, you know, twigs and everything in my hair. Um, just was, a, and, and I was crying and I, and I got in his car and I said, I've been raped. Can you take me to the police station? And the guy was just being, trying to be as nice as he could, but I, like, I couldn't get myself to get into the car. And I said, now, you got to promise me that you're not going to rape me. Oh. And he was trying, right? He said, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Now, come on, get in, get in. He was speaking Spanish a lot and I couldn't really understand a lot of what he was saying but there was a part of me before I went into the police station even though I didn't know him I hadn't been drinking I hadn't been flirting I wasn't wearing anything sexy there's a part of me that said you better put on your game face mm -hmm. you better buck up girl you better not cry in front of these police officers and you if you want to uh, have this guy be caught you right so I think every woman fears that they're not going to be believed mm -hmm. and that, um, and, and for, and, and they have, most of us, we have very good reason for believing that, which is for most of history, uh, a woman, a, a woman's word is not as, as credible as a man's word. Well, and, and even in all of these very well publicized cases ever since, you know, people are talking about since Harvey Weinstein, right? But if we talk about since Bill Cosby, uh, over 50 women publicly accused Bill Cosby with almost the same story. Right. right. Uh, Harvey Weinstein was numerous women. Over 15 women accused President Trump of sexual assault um, and on and on. And many of these, it's, it's repeated multiple women with the same story right. um, with the doctor for the gymnastics team. Uh, right. Larry Nasser. Who is in jail. Yay. Um, yay victory. And were you involved in that case? I'm an expert witness in the case, in the civil cases. Okay. So I guess yeah. you can't talk about it. No, I can talk about oh, it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so over 150 women uh, right. accused him before he was uh, put in jail. Yeah. Well, that's not quite true. Uh, a lot of women accused him. And then after uh, he actually got put in prison and got arrested, not for what he did to the gymnast, but be, what he was doing to a neighbor and because he had all this child pornography on his computer. Mm. So that's what initially got him in prison. I know that. And yeah. And, um, and, but he's admitted to um, uh, molesting 10 gymnasts. So, but certainly not all of them. But then it sort of gave permission for more women to come forward, mm -hmm. right? For them to, um, to feel like that they would be believed. 
Mm -hmm. And we do feel like this safety in numbers. There um, is I, think, safety in I think also many times when you go through something so traumatic, uh, sometimes we question our own recollection of the situation. Uh, you know, like we said, like, you know, when I say, I clearly remember him saying, I can't believe you did that. Right. Uh, you know, it just sounds unbelievable. It yeah. sounds like, mm -hmm. but I couldn't make that up. That right. is just, right. Right. And, but we question ourselves. And then eventually we say, did that really happen mm -hmm. that way? Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. That really? You know, did I yeah, sometimes in, in, I've, been, you know, I've had lots of instances of sexual harassment, but in my particular case, yeah. I did not question it once <laughs> ever, ever that this was as uh, horrific and damaging and um, intentionally harmful as possible. But yeah, so, you know, it, particularly like in work situations or somebody's trying to be funny or, you know, I kind of, mm, you know, you're not really sure, but not this one. <laughs> yeah. So I had, obviously, as a physician, I had numerous experiences of sexual harassment, especially being in OBGYN, which is a surgical specialty, and surgeons are notorious. And certainly at that time, there were very few women in medicine, or relatively mm -hmm. few. Uh, but there was one guy in particular who, when I was a resident, he was an attending surgeon. Mm -hmm. And we were literally in the operating room, operating on a patient right next to each other, and his hand was groping my thigh. And oh I just, gosh. you know, again, it was like, is it, it was an out of body. It was like, is this really happening? Right. And, you know, for everybody who wants to say, oh, maybe you were dressed provocative. I was wearing oh. surgical scrubs, surgical gown, a mask, mm -hmm. a hat, right. you know, right. the booties, the whole thing, gloves. And so what I did is I took his hand and I held it up in front of everybody in the operating room. And I said, does this belong to anybody? I found it on my leg. And Thank it was you. a humorous way of handling it. Unfortunately, we both had to go out and re-scrub. Uh, but as far as my career, he certainly never wanted to operate with me again. Uh, and I certainly never wanted to operate with him again, but he was a professor and an attending, and I was supposed to be learning from him. Right. Uh, the lesson yeah. I learned was not the lesson I intended to learn. But so did you, did you report him? I did not. Mm -hmm. um, certainly everybody in the operating room at that time knew about it. Mm -hmm. But I think there were just so many situations mm -hmm. like that, that yeah. that wasn't even on my radar screen at the time as being something reportable. So w would you report now? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And would you encourage young women to, who are, you know, just who were your age at the time to report? Absolutely. And first of all, Let's take away the fact that he shouldn't have been groping my leg in the middle right. of surgery. Right. He, should, he should not any have been sexually surgeon, assaulting you. Any surgeon who breaks, it's called breaking scrub, you know, oh. if you keep your hand not sterile. So right. if you keep your hand, if you break sterility for any reason, right. you don't immediately self say, oh, I accidentally touched the table or I accidentally touched something that was not sterile. I need a new glove immediately that's really malpractice. Yeah. So aside from the fact that this was sexual harassment and assault, right? Uh, it was also malpractice. Um, and it also put the patient at risk, not just because he was potentially then infected, uh, but also because we both had to leave the room and leave the patient on the table under anesthesia for um, longer, right? For longer than she had to be. Right. And I honestly don't even remember what her condition was. But in any situation with anesthesia, you don't want to be under, under anesthesia for any Right, and can you imagine like, what if there had been like a 911 situation, right? All of a sudden her blood pressure drops or I'm just making it up, or right? There's a 911 and you, well, the you don't have the option of- The anesthesiologist was still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, but I'm yeah. saying, you know- this was, a, this was definitely a case of medical malpractice waiting to happen. But right. absolutely, I would encourage anyone to report. The other thing is, you. Many times women don't know who to report to. And True. many times in these situations, right. we don't know who to tell, mm -hmm. but you also are feeling like this is just so bizarre. So right. you don't have to go directly to the chairman of the department or directly to the police. You can talk to a friend who's not frazzled in the moment. You can talk to you know, another woman. You can talk to your mom. Right. Um, so right. at what point did you tell your mother about what? Now, obviously, oh, we oh, oh, that, in those that, that night, that night. So did yeah. you call from the police station or? 
Um, when I was at the police station, I called um, my coach, um, who's just a, was he died, unfortunately, a while ago, but uh, I called my coach and he was not available. I called um, I, the head physician for all of um, uh, Duke's athletics and he was a friend of my dad's and he was not available. And so I called my best friend mm -hmm. and her, Terry Conklin, and she came and, you know, I just, you just couldn't ask for a nicer, better friend. She, it was, we, we, we were at the, at the police station so much that semester that she had to drop a class. I dropped oh two God. classes. She had to drop a class. And so her, she had to take an extra class her second semester senior year. She was a couple of years ahead of me mm -hmm. in school. So, but she was the captain of the swim team and, you know, had recruited me to come there. And, you know, I'm the godmother of her oldest. Uh, she's the godmother of my oldest child. You know, we're dear, dear, dear friends. But I mean, I don't know what I would have done if Terry hadn't uh, been there. And really, um, I, I think there are two ways that women need to be believed and need to be taken seriously. And one is that it happened. Right. Okay. So, you know, that, that a, another surgeon did grab your leg, right? They believe that. But two is to appreciate the impact that it has on somebody emotionally. Mm -hmm. And to, I, I, I see it a lot. I'm an expert witness in lots of cases where, you know, they just like tell the women like, buck up, like, come on. And they don't understand when her grades slip and maybe she's drinking too much and she's not going to class as much as she should and whatever. And they're, they, they just want, and then they use that as an excuse to punish her mm -hmm. instead of being empathetic and realizing like, okay, you're in a crisis situation right now. What can we do to make sure that this sexual assault does not impact your educational trajectory? And if, so if we believe both those kinds of things, right, that it happened and the, the harm that results from it, because um, there's really not a lot of empathy for, for what that causes. I mean, if, if there was empathy, uh, <clears throat> Larry Nasser would have been reported to the police much, much sooner. Uh, USA Gymnastics did not tell um, Michigan State University about uh, what that they were investigating him, that they had all these complaints. And meanwhile, a minimum of 22 more women were abused. A minimum of 20, up to 100 were abused. So that's, that's a system. Those are people who are making decisions that do not appreciate the profound effect that it has on a woman's life and her emotional development and, and you know, et cetera. Well, the most alarming statistic I heard about educational trajectory uh -huh. is that girls who are abused uh, sexually are four times more likely to drop out of high school in the general population. Sure. And what struck me about that statistic is that's high school. That means these girls were sexually mm -hmm. abused before they were seniors in high school. Yeah, sure. And so this is starting really young. Uh, the, the patient I remember the most who was a child who was sexually abused was a six-year-old who I had to do a GYN exam under general anesthesia because she was so distraught. And obviously we then had to do a rape kit. And I'll never forget the mother uh, started yelling at us and saying, I don't understand what's wrong with you doctors. This keeps happening and she keeps getting this and I keep bringing her back and it happens again. Happens meaning she thought she just had some kind of vaginal problem. Oh. The mother couldn't process that she had gonorrhea and she oh. was getting reinfected um, because oh. she was getting raped right. again by somebody who had gonorrhea and was not treated. Oh. Um, and in many cases, it's you know, usually That's brutal. the mother's boyfriend or somebody the mother knows. But as far as the cost of this, and you, know, you brought up empathy. Um, and you know, we already talked about one in six women having been sexually assaulted or had an attempted rape or rape, um, which is a huge number and a huge, huge percentage. And all of those women have best friends and loved ones and family members and yeah, who they've told and who know about this. But for people who have no empathy, I like to talk to them in terms of money. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Because money people can understand. This costs us in the United States, $750 billion, billion. is the amount we spend as a result, as a country. Yeah, be with a billion. Violence, uh, right. Sexual violence and sexual abuse. And then I also found a statistic 
that the average woman who had an attempted rape or completed rape has lost $241,600. I have no idea how that statistic was calculated right. in lost income over their lifetimes. Sure. Which is staggering. It and is. Another really unbelievable financial statistic that I found is rape kits, kits of course, have a cost attached to them. In many cases, yeah. they're way behind in evaluating the rape kits. In many cases, they don't have enough. They cost anywhere from $400 to $1,500. And depending on your location, in some places, local police departments are having the women who were raped pay for their rape kit. Oh, that's ridiculous. Um, so yeah. that, There's no other crime victim where the crime, the victim has got to pay for <clears throat> the fingerprinting that needs to be done <clears throat> if somebody's, you know, if somebody gets something stolen or, you know, the looking for the criminal background of, or the criminal uh, computer traces if somebody's computer gets hacked. I mean, that's, but tell me one other I, crime where the victim has to pay. I that's, cannot think of one. Yeah, um, and then when in you, what you were talking about the educational trajectory and lost opportunity, right? Um, you know, other staggering statistics from my cheat sheet here: um, girls sixteen to nineteen are four times more likely than people in the gen women in the general population to be right. rape victims. Right. And college students are three times more likely. Yeah, and they call it the danger zone. It's the first three months of college when they for freshman and sophomore year, right? When they come back, it's uh, it's yeah, yeah. I think of just for me how Duke really took care of me and were very very good to me. Um, but I had to drop two classes, as I said, and I didn't pay for those classes. And a lot of times, a lot of schools they will make the student still pay for it. It was past the drop ad period, and it was past. Normally it would have been with it would have been a WF on my transcript, uh -huh. and there was <clears throat> there was nothing on my transcript, and then uh, uh, I I didn't take my finals. Um, I got into two car accidents, Bing Bing, and my parents said just get on a plane and get home, and so I did, and so I didn't take my finals until I got back, which means that those professors had to create all new exams. Um, I had to get moved on to Maine West. I couldn't walk through the woods to get back to my dorm room. I had got a special parking pass that allowed me that I didn't, again, I didn't have to go through any woods or night area or, or uh, you know, night air uh, to go from my car. Um, so, uh, you know, when I, you know, they get provided with counseling. Um, I did not have to swim that year, right? So they redshirted me, so they gave me a full scholarship. Um, right, so when you add up sort of all the costs of what that costs somebody, I'm not surprised at at um, at, at what it costs. You know, it's not it's not also not surprising that some of the first cases that have come out uh, against schools that are not properly addressing sexual violence on campus have to come from the very best schools because people who go to Harvard, in your case, Princeton or Yale <clears throat> or uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill or University of Virginia, when they go to these very good schools, the, the female says, <clears throat> I don't want to leave school, yeah. but I cannot be around this guy. Mm -hmm. I cannot run into him at parties. I must be away from him. And so they expect the school to get them out and they want to stay at Harvard and Yale and Princeton and, and wherever. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that that's a large part of uh, the, the, the young women today. I have to tell you, I am so impressed with them uh, on their own, really shedding this whole idea of shame and uh, this whole idea, like they, they get it that uh, yes, they may have been drinking or yes, they may have been wearing some of the swishy skirt. I mean, we have all done these things. Uh, but it's not their fault. And Absolutely. whose fault it is, is the person that raped them, the person that drugged them, the person that uh, committed sexual act, uh, right? So, and so they got that. And not all of them. It's yeah, yeah, much more, thousands of them, right. At a very are, young yeah. age. I mean, this is, you know, I, I think it's very impressive I uh, to get it uh, at age, you know, whatever, that you know, between 17 and, you know, 20 years old, uh, and I really think that that was the precursor to the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. that it took that first all these college students came forward and demanded that their schools really take sexual violence seriously. Mm -hmm. And then uh, everybody else got to, 
got to be part of it. But I, I credit the End Rape on Campus, the National Women's Law Center did so much. The, uh, there's an organization called Know Your Nine, with no, K-N-O-W-U-R-I-X, Know Your Nine. Um, there's some really uh, great groups out there that, uh, that their, their spillover effect has been tremendous. Well, I love the Columbia University student who um, had been raped, who felt that the university was not addressing the issue. And her form of protest was carrying around her mattress right. um, as she went around campus to generate awareness and, um, and media attention, which it obviously did. I don't know what the punchline of that story was, though. Uh, but you mentioned Know Your Nine, which is a great segue to please explain to our listeners who don't know mm -hmm. what Title IX is and how it affects their daily lives without them even knowing about it. Oh, great. Thanks for that opportunity. So Title IX is a statute. It's a law. It's a federal law. It applies to all schools that receive federal funds. So there are lots of ways schools can get federal, federal funds, but the main way that they get it is through student loans. Mm -hmm. And so if they get one dollar, usually they get millions and millions of dollars, but if they get a dollar, then sort of the agreement is we give you money in exchange for which you agree not to discriminate based on sex. Um, Title IX was passed in 1972, and uh, the, uh, there was another statute called Title VI that was passed in 1964 that was the exact same statute, except that instead of the word sex, it said race, color, national origin. Yeah. So first schools, if they accepted federal funds, they had to agree not to discriminate based on race, color, national origin, and then it took those eight years before it went from race over to sex discrimination. It has also been, there's two more statutes. One is on age discrimination. The other one's on ability. So you've got four statutes that are all basically similar. So it says you can't discriminate based on sex. What does that mean? There are lots of ways to discriminate. One is you can just say you can't come to school here. Before Title IX, University of Virginia admitted less than 2% of the women that applied to go to its schools. You had to be hyper, hyper, hyper qualified. They had a quota on the small number of women that they would admit into the school. Um, and uh, the only the ninth class of women at Princeton. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did not, uh, the first fully co-educational class graduated from Princeton in 1973. Wow. I know, I know. We, we forget really how new that women being in higher education really is. Now, does Title IX only apply to higher education or all educational? All, every school, right. graduate school, elementary school, everything. If a school receives federal dollars, they cannot discriminate based on sex. So, so my claim to fame, if I have one, uh -huh. I was the first girl in New York uh, to compete on a boys' team because of oh, Title really? IX. So my uh, neat. Huh. Yeah, that's another way that a school can discriminate based on right. sex. They can not girls swim team. Uh, you know, my high school had 5,100 students, oh. uh, which is just staggering. We that's had, a lot. That's a huge had school. a pool, a great pool yeah. in the building, and we didn't have a girls swim team. Wow. We had tennis courts and we didn't yeah. have a girls tennis team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I challenged the Board of Education um, and threatened to sue. We didn't have to sue. They eventually caved, but their excuse for not originally not letting me be on the boys team is they said they didn't have a teacher who would be able to supervise me in the girls locker room by myself. <laughs> uh, my mother was a high school teacher at that school. And so oh. my mother, you know, volunteered to be the teacher. Uh, and then her union chastised her and gave her some kind of citation for violating union rules for volunteering to do wow. that because she wasn't being paid. Wow. Um, so I don't know how they resolved that, but I did swim on the, on the boys swim team and also they played on the boys tennis team. Yeah, athletics presents this unique challenge because if you want to give girls and women an equal opportunity to be able to participate in sports as opposed to the math class, you have to create a whole new team typically. So an exceptional swimmer like yourself is going to be able to make the boys team, but... Uh, we just had a really bad boys team. <laughs> but they did right, make all city. It, right, if you, want, if you want the masses to be at right, we're talking there, there are um, 3.1, 3.2 million girls playing high school sports right now. If you want to talk about those kind of numbers, then you have to create a separate team. You'll always, you're always going to have really elite, elite women who are going to be able to make the boys team. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, 
um, right? So, you know, the, the English class, the math class, psychology, et cetera, all they had to do is just make it gender blind. Like whoever had the SAT GPA can get into this class as opposed to the, the, the athletic department had to double itself or had to create a whole new enterprise. And so there's just some tricky legal kinds of things there. Um, but in, in, in addition, and I have to say, I am the great beneficiary of Title IX in that not only did I uh, get a college scholarship, women who were just two years older than I was and who were equally sort of had my same credentials did not get college scholarships. Mm -hmm. And so if I had just been a couple years older, it would not have happened. Didn't matter how hard I worked, didn't matter how talented I was or what my accomplishments were, without that statute, wasn't going to happen. Well, in your bio is that you got the first uh, swimming scholarship at Duke. Was that for women or for, it was for women. women or men? Oh, yeah, not men, please. They had scholarships. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have to deal with that. I went to a school where nobody got athletics. Uh, right, right. And that's actually why I didn't go Ivy League. My brother went Ivy League. <laughs> and a lot of people I, don't. I felt like I'd kind of earned it at that point. I had been training hard for a long time. Anyway, <laughs> certainly so, earned. Um, uh, so, so, but, but it, Title IX also applies to pregnancy discrimination, to um, uh, it applies and applies to sexual harassment and sexual assault. So you think like, what are all the ways that somebody could discriminate against somebody racially, mm -hmm. right? There's lots of ways that that can play out. Same thing with sex discrimination. There's lots of ways to discriminate and Title IX protects uh, women and men for all of it. Tell me, uh, now we've gone through Title IX, Tell me mm -hmm. about safe sport and oh, what sure. you're doing legislatively. Okay. I think this is yep, fascinating yep, yep. as yeah. well as timely and current events. And also I want our audience to participate in this good. Uh, and get involved in making this happen. Okay, good, good, good. So uh, I spent all this time working on Title IX dealing with schools and it included sexual harassment and sexual assault. A student calls me up and they tell me that they were sexually abused by their coach mm -hmm. and I know what to do. So I know who to call and how to, what, what law to use and what facts to gather. Okay. Same, uh, same fact pattern calls me, but this time the athlete is not a, uh, a part of a school system and instead they are part of a club system, right? Or part of the Olympic movement, mm -hmm. right? In that case, there's, there was back then, I started doing this almost eight years ago, uh, there was almost nothing. There was no insurance. There was no tort law. There was no, I mean, there was tort law, but there was nothing to go after, right? The, um, the, there was no, um, uh, the, the, if you made a report to the national governing body, the national governing body, their, their legal excuse that, that USA Gymnastics is using to this day with Larry Nasser is we don't owe the kid who was abused a legal duty. Mm -hmm. It's not our job. And, uh, just to, just to backtrack a little bit on what, what does it mean to have a legal duty? Uh, if you and I, Donica, are walking across the street here and, uh, and, and I can see very easily that you're about to get hit by a car and I don't do anything about it and you do get hit by a car, you can't sue me because I don't owe you a legal duty to prevent that from happening. Even though I could have done it so easily and I saw it coming and I could just one finger tap, I could have prevented it, okay? That's the concept of legal duty. If I tell you, uh, if you're my child, I have a legal duty to you. So you could, the child <laughs> hypothetically could sue to say you didn't protect me, you could have done it really easily. To, or, uh, or protective I, services could get involved and say you were negligent. There you go, there you go. Mm -hmm. Or um, if I said to you, Donica, let me help you cross the street here. I have now accepted a legal duty. So what, what USA Gymnastics is doing is by saying, we're not saying, let me help you. Let me take on that responsibility. Let me get sexual abusers out of sport. By doing that, they make it, they shield themselves from any kind of legal liability. So they were really picking, uh, you know, tort liability over victims. And because of that, literally thousands and thousands of kids have been abused under that uh under that doctrine they chose money and and success and medals over athletes future so it's not just gymnastics so we could be just to be clear about that gymnastics is not the only sport where this happens no no you know so there's there's the ussoc united states mm -hmm. Olympic committee and then under there there's 47 different national governing bodies so there's swimming and track and field and taekwondo and soccer and right you get the idea right there's archery and all the olympic sports but there's 47 of them 
and uh, and um, so um, so okay so uh, in uh, 2014 I petitioned the uh, International Olympic Committee to try to keep this guy Chuck Wildness he used to be the head of the United States swimming from being in the Hall of Fame because he had done such a pathetic, miserable job of handling sexual abuse within our sport. Mm -hmm. And it got a ton of media attention, and we were successful. So after Yay. only about five days, Chuck Wagas out of the Hall of Fame. Yay. Yay. And, uh, and um, so about a week later, Scott Blackman, who's the head of the United States Olympic Committee, says, we're going to create a separate entity that is going to uh, investigate and sanction sexual abusers. And we're going to get them out. And so, you know, I'm thinking, boy, we really have done something here. And it took almost three years to get Safe Sport up and running. So March 2017, Safe Sport finally opens. And it's kind of like the uh, USADA. Are you familiar with the United States Anti-Doping Agency? Uh, I am, but why don't you explain to people? Okay, yeah. yeah. So Happy. yeah, before USADA, the United States Anti-Doping Agency, this is like who does all the pee testing and the blood testing to make sure there are no performance enhancing drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, before them, who was responsible for that was the national governing bodies, these same folks we're talking about. And they did a terrible job. They had about four positive drug tests a year. After you get independence, you also get independence, you get expertise when, right? Uh, when you have the separate entity and they right, had about- I don't four, have the foxes watching the hen house. Foxes, right, right. Can you imagine USA Cycling trying to discipline Lance Armstrong? There's just no way. I mean, he's their cash cow. If, or if, Marilyn if, Jones and then in track and Phoenix right, and right, right, right. These are their money makers for the sport. They're not. They don't want them to get in trouble. Right. So, so, uh, so it went from four positive drug tests a year to forty-four positive drug tests a year. So that's a big difference. Uh, what independence gets you, and what also expertise gets you. People who really know what they're doing. Well, um, and the irony too is now that that exists. I'm guessing athletes are going to be less likely to try to get away with something. Although I'm sure it still happens. Are you talking about USADA? Yeah, well, I'm talking about athletes who are being supervised by this now independent group, as opposed to before when they were uh, supervised by their governing body. Yeah, I would hope so. I, I mean, you know, if you were in good graces with your national governing body, uh, you know, you could get away with a lot, especially if you were one of those long-term players. Um, you know, my coach was a long-term player. My 1984 Olympic coach, his name is Mitch Ivey, and he abused lots of his swimmers. Uh, he did not molest me, but he was molesting my teammate at the time. And it took us 30 years to get this guy out. And did you know about it at the time? Oh, of course, everybody. He, listen, this guy never tried to hide it. And how he would language it, he wouldn't say, oh, this is who I'm molesting, <laughs> he would say. He would say, this is my girlfriend. Oh, my and God. Oh, yeah. No, he was totally upfront. Like, this is my girlfriend. And um, he married three of his swimmers, usually right when they turned 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. And the total of, the, of, the, of three of those marriages did not equal one year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So it was just sort of validating. He used marriage to validate what molestation that had been going on for years. Yeah, I feel guilty retrospectively because there were two coaches in particular that I knew about one coach, everybody was talking about it. And in fact, his team was mostly girls and yeah. they all looked almost exactly alike. And we used to joke about it. And now that I think about it retroactively, what, where were the parents? They were joking about this. And yeah. I wasn't on that team right. for that reason. My sister later joined that team. And I only asked her about two years ago mm -hmm. uh, if anything ever happened with her. And she said it didn't, but she knew about, you know, lots of other. Uh, knew about lots of others, right. But it's like Weinstein, coach, like everybody knew, right? Another coach, I honestly did not know. And he was my coach and I never had a problem with him. Yeah, and yeah. I understand through the grapevine that he has just been asked to retire after uh -huh. all of these years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in large part because of that. Um, but then there was another coach who I suspected. But what they all did is these creepy back rub things, you know, on the mm -hmm. deck and they would come up and touch you everywhere. And we didn't even consider that inappropriate mm. at the time. Right. You know, although it was really kind of creepy. Yeah, there, there, there has not been the same norms around sexual um, relationships or dating with regard to coach athlete as there is, for example, you in your case, a physician patient, mm -hmm. right? So I'm sure you were sort of got hammered into you, you will not 
have a romantic or sexual relationship with one of your patients. Quite that honestly, right? that's not true because uh -huh. certainly with respect to me and certainly uh -huh. with women in OBGYN, it, nobody ever occurred to anybody that that might not e that might even be an issue. Um, when I was in training, it became a thing for uh, patients and patient bill of rights for uh -huh. patients to be able to ask for a woman to be present if they were having an internal exam by a male doctor. Yeah, and the women doctors kind of got a little shafted on this because huh. the male doctors all then got assistance. And they oh. all had somebody to help them and be right. in the room. And right. we had to do everything ourselves uh, because we were considered. Interesting. I remember one time I did a year of family practice and my very first patient was an extremely large, scary looking uh, prisoner who came huh. in in shackles in his orange jumpsuit. Uh -huh. And I look at the chart and the reason for his visit is that he has a lesion on his penis. So oh. I have to do a penis exam on my first male patient in years. Wow. Um, and I just went to the chief resident who was also a very large guy. And I said, look, if women, uh, if men doctors could request a, whim a woman to be in the room to assist them yeah. in a GYN exam, I can request you to be in the room with me when I have to examine. Good. Good. And yeah. then I was just trying to make small talk with this prisoner. And I asked him why he was in jail. And he said, because he murdered his mother. <laughs> Oh and I just, I just said, I couldn't think of anything else to say. I said, you don't think I remind you of your mother, do you? Yeah, right. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, you know, 27 years old at the time in a ponytail. Right. Um, right, but but, but, but I, I guess the, 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 the overarching point is that when we were in, when we were swimming, coaches just did date their athletes, mm -hmm. right? In a way okay, that- Princeton, the males, the men's swim coach married one of the women's swimmers. There you go, right, there are lots, of, right. As opposed to, you know, I, I'm, I, me as a lawyer, I got it hammered into me that if you wanna lose your license, a great way to do it is to have a sexual relationship with one of your clients. Um, or, uh, you know, somebody who's a prison guard or a family member or um, a, a religious leader or, uh, a therapist or a counselor, right? We have these very bright line rules and we don't, when it comes to sports, which I find to be a little shocking, we, champion women, we've spent a lot of time uh, trying to change some of those norms of behavior because, um, because even, even what I would consider like good guy coaches, like guys that not in a million years, I mean, you know, 15 year olds could run naked in front of them and there's no way that anything is going to happen. But even though I say like, well, as long as she's of age, what's wrong with it? Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with it is that um, it's a violation of power. It's a, it's a violation of trust. It's a huge uh, power dynamic. Exactly. Uh, but right. it and also makes all your other athletes right. uh, feel extremely uncomfortable. And it right. creates an atmosphere of fear. You know, I definitely feared many of my coaches. Yeah, uh, it was very uncomfortable being alone with two of them, even though, again, nothing had ever happened with yeah. them. Right, uh, right, right. It me, and it's certainly, but, again, but, but also a coach is my performance. <laughs> they determine, yeah, scholarship amounts, they determine playing time, they determine like who gets promoted to be the most elite athlete, who gets thrown the ball, who is the stroke for, let's say, a rowing type thing. Um, so coaches can really determine an athletic trajectory. And so that's another reason why um, I, I'll give you another great example. There's a, there's an athlete named Eva Radansky mm -hmm. who she was a speed skater and her coach that, or the national team coach was having a romantic relationship with her um, biggest competitor, mm. her rival. And sure enough, he worked very hard to protect his, the, his, his partner mm -hmm. over Eva. So even though the two of the, the, you know, uh, Mike Crow and this woman had, they didn't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. uh, it affected everybody else and even never made an Olympic team, which is, you know, it's a real shame for her. Right. But, um, right. So there, anyway, there was all this sort of mischiefy kinds of things that happen uh, when you have these romantic and sexual relationships. Um, but, but another, I think, major thing is that when a 11 year old or 12 or 13 or 14 year old sees their coaches marrying their uh, older teammates, they think that when they get kissed as a 12 or 13 year old, they think it's true love. They yeah. think this is appropriate. They think this is 
you know, a fine place to find, right? Then they, they may get, oh, the problem is that there's an age difference between us, but you know, I'm so much more mature. (laughs) And anyway, I, we could talk about this all day long. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up, but I do want you to get to the point where you talk about trying to legislate this. Sure. So there's a, there's a piece of legislation called, uh, Senate bill 534 protecting young victims from sexual abuse and authorizing safe sport, safe sport being the separate entity that we were talking about. So the legislation does a couple things. One is that legal defense. I was telling you about that. They're saying it's not my job. It says, yes, it is your job. You have a duty to uh, educate your members on sexual abuse and to put out and to take reports and to report to the police. And right. So it is your job. So it does that. Uh, It says that if somebody is abused, that they can sue their abuser directly and get one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in presumed damages. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And it create it creates this thing, safe sport. Right. So USADA. United States Anti-Doping Agency is also a creation of statute. It gives okay. this entity about a million dollars a year uh, so that they can function. There's, they still need more uh, to be able to function. They're always looking for sponsorship dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, but it will be their job to handle complaints of sexual abuse. The national governing bodies, those 47 different entities, are still responsible for physical abuse. Sometimes you know, athletes get hit or whatnot, or emotional abuse. So they're still responsible for that, for that. but um, 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 you know the, the statute will go a long way towards making youth sports mu- a much safer experience. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to scare parents, but really, if if you were in my shoes and you saw the legal difference between a kid who's in school and a kid who's at a club sport, you would be horrified. And I bet for most of the parents are out there who are listening. I bet you anything, you signed a waiver before you started uh, reading it. <laughs> exactly, right. So, so there won't be any. Okay. So, so it's, it's Senate Bill 534. It does not have a House number yet. Uh, what needs person, to happen to make this into law? Right. Congressman Kevin McCarthy is holding it up. We're trying to get it from to where? have it where be. Is he from? A, He's uh, California. He's so a California everybody guy. listening who is in California, who is right. Everybody who's in California, district. right? So we want to get it on the suspension calendar. Mm-hmm. This statute has already. It's bipartisan. Both parties have come together. The United States Olympic Committee wants it passed, as does the uh, the Athlete Advisory Council wants it passed, right? So everybody everybody wants it passed. And how is Kevin McCarthy blocking this or not cooperating? We don't know. We don't know exactly what it is. Um, I heard one thing that they were worried that, um, you know, I remember I was talking to you about the 150,000 that that one uh, congressperson uh, talked to me and they thought that it would allow somebody to sue for purely emotional damages for uh, for coach. And they thought that that would take something away from the coach athlete relationship. And I assured him that the statute did not permit that, that that was not, the name of the statute is protecting young victims from sexual abuse. So that's not going to happen. Clear. Yeah, it's pretty it's clear. clear. So this, yeah. the action step that we need people to take is. is to the action love. step is, yeah, if you, if you have any way, I've been mm-hmm. using, you know, that, like that, you know, seven degrees of separation. I've been trying to find like my two or three degrees of separation between McCarthy's office. Mm-hmm. Um, the it's Susan uh, Congressperson Susan Brooks who is sponsoring it in the House. So all praises to her. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Feinstein is the one who really started off the 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 um, the, the statute. Um, she's the one who majorly crafted it, and that's who I've been working with an awful lot. And Senator Thune's office, um, he's head of the Commerce Committee, has been uh, very helpful. But uh, I think Susan Brooks and Kevin McCarthy, if we can just get Kevin McCarthy to- well, Every of that- listener of this podcast is going to call them as soon as they stop driving yes. and, uh, and can take the call or call or write. This is so important. Um, I yeah. want to thank you so much. We do have thank to wrap you, up, but I do, uh, in conclusion, I do have to just ask you a couple of questions that we ask everybody. Oh, sure. Uh, one is- what was your most memorable, unique, awful, interesting, or bizarre encounter that you ever had in a ladies' room? And since you're an athlete, we'll include locker room as part of the ladies' room. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, that, that's actually an easy one. So, <laughs> yeah. So it was, uh, I was. Everybody says that. Yeah, no, I was at a big competition and, um, uh, and uh, this was back in the East German days. And um, so, and I took a long time to warm down. I get done. Nobody else is in the locker room. And so I'm getting dressed and I hear men come in who are talking and I'm like, I'm like shouting to them like, Hey, I'm in here, get out. Uh, and so I turned the corner and it was East German women. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So these poor women, you know, they took so many steroids and so many things that they had these irreversible changes. But you know, when you hear a woman's voice or a man's voice, you know, it's, usually pretty it's obvious thinking. which one it is. And I, I thought without thinking that of course these were men who were in the locker room. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's so, actually a great yeah. story. Just <laughs> our final question. Yeah. What is the number one thing you want people to take away from our conversation today? Oh gosh. Well, um, I think it's so important that people like Donica and I talk about uh, sexual abuse and what, what our experiences have been because we want both men and women to know, young women, older women, to know that they, number one, that they're not alone because we usually don't talk about these things, that um, this is a part of a woman's life. This is what it means to be a woman, is to be catcalled when you walk out, to be scared about, to pay extra money for an apartment that is a doorman instead of being able to buy, to uh, rent the walk-up apartment, to, um, and, uh, and um, if something does happen uh, to you, you've got lots of uh, folks uh, who have walked that mile with you, that there really is hope. Those people that tend to commit suicide are people who think that it will, they will always feel the way that they did. And I'm sure you probably felt the same way, but I went through quite a long period of time of feeling perpetually scared of, uh, you know, sort of hypervigilant, of looking like making sure that I was safe. And that really did go away. And I did the work. I did hard, hard work of therapy to be able to overcome, um, you know, I have an awesome hubby and that, which is what I wanted. And I wanted kids and I got that. And, um, and, but the best thing is I can sleep at night mm -hmm. and I don't have to, um, take drugs or, uh, you know, I don't have to, Not that there's anything wrong with that. Right, right, right. If they're prescription drugs, and that's part of your therapy. And that's part of your therapy, absolutely. But, but, but I mean, it, like, there's a sense of peace that, that it can come that, um, you know, in, in some ways, um, in the, the fact that I was sexually assaulted and have been sexually harassed informs the work that I do as leading this organization, Champion Women, that I don't know if I had not been raped, if I had not been sexually harassed as many times as I have, that that would have happened, that I would have dedicated my professional life to something like this. And we so, haven't gotten to talk about champion women very much, but since we're out of time, could you just tell people where they can go to get more information? Sure. Go to www.championwomen.org. And uh, it's all one word, champion women, but we provide legal advocacy for girls and women in sports. So whether or not it's the statute, whether or not it's just Title IX compliance, like girls getting an opportunity to play, or getting treated the same way once they play. Pregnancy discrimination in athletics, a lot of coaches will say, you're pregnant, you're out, you lose your scholarship. That is absolutely a no-no. Um, and, and, and lots of other things. We help a lot of LGBT athletes who are not um, treated well. They get kicked off the team once they're found out that they're LGBT. We, um, yeah, so, so, so what, what I do is instead of representing athletes directly or, right, is I, I, I do, Champion Women does a lot of policy work, right? Like trying to get the statute passed or trying to get organizations to make different decisions or to educate the public on something so that the, the same thing doesn't keep happening. It's how do you get change to scale? That's when we figure out which projects are we going to do. That's Getting awesome. Getting change to scale. I think that is a great note to end on is getting change to scale, scaling up. You have certainly done a yeoman's work, a, an Olympic champion's work <laughs> in this arena. I could talk to you all day. Um, I think the number one thing I want people to know is that just because we're concluding this conversation right now, this is only the biggest beginning of the bigger conversation. This is the beginning, uh, the tip of the iceberg of a social conversation that we need to have. 
And of course, we need to train our daughters uh, about the realities of the situation, what's acceptable and not acceptable. But most importantly, we need to teach our sons not to sexually harass women, Absolutely. not to abuse women, and not to sexually assault women, and not just our sons, but all men need to have that message that, you know, in Oprah's words, their time is up. You know, right. that we're not going to stand. Yeah. Up. There's a small number of men out there that are creating havoc for all the rest of us. Well, actually, so can... I, you know, I didn't give you this number, but I did find no. this number. I don't know who calculated, but okay. it was estimated that 2,780,000 men have either attempted or com- uh, completed a rape since oh. 1998. Right. That's just rape. But if you look at that compared to the number of women who women, right, right. So you have a small, this, this relatively, it's not that 2 million is not a small number, but as compared with the number of victims, it's not, it's not, you know, you've got one in four women. That does not mean one in four men is a, is a rape. Right. Absolutely. And there are very, very good men out there and we need those very good men to take ownership of this issue as well. Absolutely. Today, to other men, this is not okay. Right. Anyway, this conversation has okay, been Donica. fabulous. I know all of our listeners are crying and laughing and enjoying it and really thinking about things in a different way. And that's our mission here. So thank you so much. And maybe we'll have you come back again when this statute is passed. Yay. Talk about some positive change. Right. To educate people on what they need to do. Absolutely. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Donica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies' Room with Dr. Donica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.